So I'm the second to last chairman, and many people already said many nice things about, well-deserved nice things about uh, Simon and Eliezer that uh, I would have liked to say, and they did so much more eloquently than uh, I would be able to do. I do have one thing to say that is uh, rather special for me. I'm uh, very proud to be a member of a rather exclusive club, a club of people that has worked both with Simon and with Eliezer. I think there are maybe about in the order of five more people that can say that. I don't know exactly. More. All right. Okay, I see two. And I know there is even one person that has written a paper at the same time with you. I mean, one paper with all the others. And unfortunately, he's not here at the moment, Adam Schwimmer. So it has been a great pleasure to work with both of you. In fact, even though the number of papers has been quite different with, uh, that I've written with the two of you, the amount of time we spend together has been, by my estimate, more or less the same. I spent one month on your invitation, Eliezer, in Jerusalem, very long ago, and another month in Tel Aviv on your invitation, a bit less long ago, and I enjoyed all of that tremendously. And I also was also very much impressed by the scientific atmosphere in both institutes. So um, I just want to conclude by wishing you once again a very, uh, to congratulate you first of all with your by now 61, 61st anniversary, I think, and also to express the hope that uh, we'll meet each other many times in the future and that I can extract some more bits of information from this gigantic pool that you have available there. So then I would like to give the word to the first speaker, uh, Mr. Kizaki, who will talk about some dynamical aspects of modular stabilization. Thank you. Um, <coughs> it is a, a, a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to speak on this occasion. I've known Eliezer and uh, Shimon, you know, uh, for many years, basically, throughout my career. Uh, wasn't lucky enough to actually collaborate with, with Eliezer, but we had, uh, you know, lots of uh, nice discussions about physics, mainly, also some non-physics discussions. It was lots of fun for me. Hopefully not uh, too boring for Eliezer. Um, as far as collaboration, you know, the, the, the night is still young and, you know, maybe I'll get lucky. Um, with Shimon, of course, I worked a lot uh, uh, when I was a student here um, in Tel Aviv. Uh, if my memory serves me well, we wrote uh, eight papers together. Uh, it was and still is uh, a great uh, experience uh, to work with him. The energy uh, and all of this in special enthusiasm that he brings and um, how much he cares about physics, his students, and all of that, it's quite remarkable. Um, and for that reason, I'm uh, particularly happy that today I get to talk about a uh, work in progress that uh, Shimon and I are doing with, uh, with Iran. Okay, so uh, the title is uh, Some uh, Dynamical Aspects of Modular Stabilization. And the, uh, yes, so the motivation uh, is, uh, well, the, 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 there are different ways, of course, to motivate. It's, it's a very, uh, it's a huge uh, subject. It, uh, there are different ways to motivate it. But uh, one particular uh, way that, well, you might, uh, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, one one uh, particular motivation is actually the cosmological constant problem. And usually we like to say that there are two ways to uh, deal with the cosmological constant problem. One is that there is some kind of uh, dynamical uh, mechanism that uh, relaxes the cosmological constant. We don't quite know what it is. We have a, a large dark matter or relatively big dark matter during inflation. It relaxes towards what we find now. And it would be very nice if we could find something like that. And the different approach is that there is some kind of entropic reasoning which tells us that basically we live where we can live. And, well, typically uh, the way that people uh, motivate this entropic reasoning is by counting, um, by counting uh, basically uh, levels, different levels. Um, if you think about this, uh, well, we have some 
landscape with plenty of local, hopefully long live minima, and we just uh, count them, and we are trying to uh, argue that, as I said before, we live where we can. But as uh, most of you here, I'm sure, uh, are very much aware of, this by itself is not quite enough. We still have the, uh, this uh, empty universe problem, which is a very uh, nagging problem. Um, basically, the problem is that even if we count all of these minima and we find some density near zero, we still have to convince ourselves that when we end up there, we don't end up having a universe which is empty. And to make, so basically, the, roughly speaking, the statement is that it's not enough that the cosmological constant is much smaller than the Planck scale. We also have to explain how come the cosmological constant is much smaller than the reheating temperature. Uh, mainly, namely, we have to make sure that we really have something, um, as we, we, that we have some temperature that uh, is much bigger. It might be much smaller than the Planck scale, but it still has to be much bigger than the cosmological constant. OK, so this, uh, so. Uh, Okay, so so uh, so that's the that's the that's a concern, and there is actually a very uh, simple and beautiful example that illustrates that problem, which is due to Abbott from uh, '85. So what Abbott uh, did was to uh, he came up with a very elegant uh, model. Basically, you have an axion here, and then you add some a tiny little slope there, this epsilon phi, and if you integrate out, you know, the, the instant terms, et cetera, you get the potential for this uh, scalar, which is this uh, term here, the same term. And then I have this contribution from the instant terms. And I add to that potential uh, whatever the normalized cosmological constant that you've got. So the potential looks something like that. Well, that's, well, forget about the scale. But basically, you have lots of, lots of minima. And we start, suppose that the, uh, the normalized uh, cosmological constant is big. We start our life here. If we start high enough, then thermal fluctuation will basically uh, make sure that we jump uh, uh, from one minima to the other. Uh, thermal due to the Sitter acceleration, I mean. But eventually, if we go down enough here, the, uh, the temperature is going to be small, so we really have to tunnel. And the tunneling, as you know, grows exponentially as we decrease the energy. So tunneling from here, from that point to that point, uh, is much is exponentially faster than tunneling from this point to that point. So uh, he concluded that it's most likely that we'll end up living here. But he also pointed out that because uh, that we have this uh, empty universe problem here, um, and the problem is, well, there are two sub-problems here. First of all, we have to tunnel at the end. So this tunneling, just like in old inflation, it dilutes all matter and radiation that we have. So uh, even if we just happen to have something here, by the time we go down there, we'll find out that basically we have no uh, temperature. Uh, the other problem is that even if we, the, the other problem is that even if we manage to kill that, uh, that, uh, that barrier and we just roll down there, then the jump, the, the last jump is simply too small and the rating temperature that you'll find, even if you oscillate here, is just going to be too small, even if, you're, uh, pro even if the process is very efficient. So this is a very nice example because here, you know, if you just count the minima, you see, you know, you can play with the parameters and make sure that you have lots of minima and you are convinced that because of some entropic reasonings, uh, you end up living here. But entropic reasonings are not going to help you because regardless of what you do, you always end up with an empty universe and we cannot live in, a, in an empty universe. So this model plus entropic reasoning gives you basically uh, basically nothing. Okay, now uh, Busso and Polchinski, uh, 15 years after uh, this paper, made a, a couple of nice observations. First of all, they pointed out that if you add, uh, if you have more directions, 
then it's possible that, what well, I have to go back actually, that we can make sure that this last jump is actually not too small. Yes? Well, because in slow roll inflation, it's very hard to make sure, uh, you know, on general grounds that you end up with a very small cosmological function. Okay, so, but that's exactly, that, that's related to what uh, Busso and Polchinski pointed out, that if you have many directions, then the last jump can be I, and you may, if, if you manage to make sure that you slow roll there, then it might be that you actually end up with our universe. And the other nice point that they made, of course, is that you don't, to end up with exponentially small cosmological constant, you don't need to have exponentially large number of uh, fields. You just need a few hundreds, and in string theory, we can imagine that something like that might happen. But the conclusion from all of that is, well, Conclusion from all of that. Well, well, uh, wait. I suppose that also was right, and one should use transparency. Um, okay, so, um, yes, so the conclusion from all of that is uh, whether or is that at the end of the day we do need to convert somehow the potential energy into it, and that process is definitely a dynamical process. So, the two options that I previously mentioned are, one is that there is some dynamical mechanism that just happened to work perfectly, and the other is that there is a dynamical mechanism, but we still have to impose some anthropic uh, reasoning. So, regardless of these two options, it's kind of obvious that we need to understand better the dynamical mechanism. Now, as you can imagine, I'm not going to claim that I solved the problem or anything like that in the context of string theory here. But what I would like to do is to point out uh, a way to avoid a certain uh, gene fairly generic problem, uh, which is to kind of relax the tension between the, this empty universe story that I told you about and the overshooting problem, um, which I will uh, remind you of in a little bit. Okay, so that's the outline of the rest of my talk. I'll start by uh, reviewing some of, the, all of this well-known by now a time-independent modular stabilization that you can get. I'll remind you of the overshooting problem. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about some time-dependent potentials that we can uh, generate. And we'll see some of the application that you can uh, imagine. Uh, well, so first we'll talk about the overshooting problem and then We'll talk briefly about uh, improving a little bit the, the problem with the initial condition uh, for inflation. And maybe the cutest thing will be uh, some speculation about uh, mega heavy uh, uh, dark matter uh, candidates. Okay, so, um, okay, so that's the, the very brief review about uh, um, time independent potential. Uh, so I'll try to, to simplify, but hopefully not oversimplify the situation. So I have some compact manifold. The dimension of the compact manifold is D. It is 6 uh, in uh, strength theory. It's 7 in M theory. And there is a typical size to that manifold, which I will call L. And I'm going to uh, describe some contributions that you get for generating potential for that, uh, for that modulus L. Well, the first thing that you can do is you can have a D or a 3 uh, plus P brain. The 3 refers to the uh, to our four-dimensional world, so these are space-filling brains. They also uh, wrap P directions of the compact manifold. And there is something funny uh, about the potential that these brains generate. Well, of course, you would expect to get the L to the P term which means that this potential grows when you increase P. But when you do this properly and you switch to the Einstein frame, you also get a term which is 1 over L to the 2D. So you end up having something like that. And since you cannot drop more directions than you have, namely P is at most D, then this term actually goes to 0 when L 
goes to infinity. So this is a bit counterintuitive, but it's, it's, it is still very much uh, the case. You can also imagine having some effluxes that go to some, uh, here I have L-flux that goes to some L-cycle. Uh, you end up having uh, something like this. You could also have terms that come from a sum of the, uh, the curvature of the compact manifold. You get stuff, something that goes like that. This is some constant that depends on the topology of this, of the uh, compact manifold. Uh, in a Calabiao, this is, of course, a zero, but you can imagine thinking about something else. And there are also instantons that play very important roles. So, so here we, here, well, there are, let's describe it that way. Here we have a, a minus one plus P brain, namely these are instantons in our four-dimensional world, and they wrap P, uh, they wrap P directions in the, uh, in the compact manifold, and we end up having a term like this. Okay, so if you, oops, okay, so if you look at all of these terms, then immediately you see two uh, general properties. Well, they all fall as uh, fast at infinity, at least as one over L to the D, and most of them are repulsive. And namely, most of them try to make sure that the, you uh, go to the uncompactify 10-dimensional uh, 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 setup. And what this means is that it's not maybe as easy as we would like it to be to find the minimum in this uh, setting. But of course, people uh, uh, made uh, significant progress in this uh, direction. And what this means is that even if we do find a minimum, then we still have to worry about the overshooting problem because uh, the potential falls fairly fast as we go, as we take as to infinity. Okay, so let me review the overshooting problem, and as far as I know, this is uh, due to, uh, to Rami and Paul uh, Steinhardt for 92, but uh, I think it's true. So the basic idea is what I, I just described. I have some... Um, <clears throat> some repulsive potential, which is this uh, black line here. And let's imagine that we have a small uh, instant on contribution that makes sure that we find here a local minima. Then you can imagine that if you start uh, somewhere up here, you will just overshoot that minima. And generically speaking, you are not going to end up here unless you fine tune your initial condition. Um, Oh. Okay, and uh, well, the point is that, well, it depends when you want to stabilize that, that uh, moduli, but generally speaking, it's fair to say that it, that problem makes it much harder to avoid the empty universe problem, because in the empty universe problem, what we need is we need to have enough potential energy that we convert into kinetic energy and if we, uh, in this case, we just have this little uh, ampere, so we simply don't have enough. So even if we start somewhere here, we are not going to generate, generically, we are not going to generate um, uh, a large enough rating temperature. Of course, one can uh, fine tune that problem, but the question is whether we want to do that. Oh, before that, before that. So this is, so this is, uh, this is exactly the, the opposite case than the one that you described in, in your talk. Yes, thank you. So inflation happens here before, and now I'm trying to understand how to read the universe and stabilize. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, well, of course we need to take into account two things here. First of all, when I talked about this L, L is not canonically normalized, and if I want to speak in terms of potential, I should, uh, I should better, uh, I should better uh, make sure that the potential is written uh, properly. And the canonically normalized uh, scalar is this one. Um, that so the, the slow yes. Why do you that the question is whether it's possible that you, uh, whether it is possible that you first inflate and after the end of inflation, you stabilize all, all the modulus. Oh, oh, stabilize afterwards. Yes. Right. 
So that's different than the thing that you will understand. Okay. The other thing, of course, is that this is misleading because when we are in a cosmological setup, we have to worry about the Hubble friction, and this tends to improve things because, well, we have, fri we have friction, so as we roll down here, we are going to lose some energy. Okay, so these are two things that we need to take into account. Um, and I should, before, before I'm talking in a, in a bit more details about it, I should mention that many people consider that problem. And uh, typically, the, the way that people like to solve the problem is to say that, let's suppose it's somewhere here, uh, some, other, okay. some other excitations gets into play, and because uh, this, uh, if this field rolls very quickly, its energy scales like a to the minus 6. You can imagine having something different that kicks in, which falls faster, and it will just stop that field, and you can uh, end up here just because of some other excitations which are uh, taking uh, action. And what I'm going to describe in spirit is very similar. It falls definitely into that category, but it is uh, very stringy, and it's kind of uh, it's almost uh, like the stringy cue for this uh, stringy, stringy uh, disease. And uh, it also leads to nice uh, or interesting uh, phenomenology, uh, uh, as we will see some dark matter issues and stuff like that. OK, so let, let, yes. One question. Yes. I'm a little bit confused. Typically, people want one thing to stabilize the light is that you need to stabilize them in order to be able to describe the pressure we use weight, but otherwise potential. All right. Uh, yes. No. No. You you can get inflation in one uh, setup, and then you can imagine there is no. The, the point is that when you roll, how shall I say? When you stabilize uh, the moderate before inflation, okay. As you roll down, you can imagine that these uh, fields uh, change. You, the value of the point where all of this uh, modular stabilization happens changes. And in particular, if, you know, if the field that actually inflate is the one that you want to stabilize at the end, the question is how you do that. So there are, set, of course, there are systems in which this is not a problem, but there are many systems in which it is. Okay? So that's the, that's the thing that I'm going to focus on in this book. Um, so let's talk um, in a bit more detail about this problem. So this is one particular uh, example that you can imagine. That's the, the well-known racetrack potential. Here the potential to leading order is basically zero. And now you just have, uh, you just have uh, some instant contribution to this potential. And if I ignore that potential and I look on solution to the equation of motion, I find that solution. And the fact that it's just log of t is because of this other friction. So we are taking the, uh, this into account. And what this gives you immediately is that the kinetic energy is going to scale like 1 over t squared, while the potential energy is going to scale like some exponent of t, because I need to put that uh, log into this exponent of that exponent. And of course, typically, that potential energy is not, it's just not big enough to, uh, to stop that kinetic energy, uh, which is to say that, of course, I can fine tune this. But gen uh, generically speaking, we are not going to find uh, the minimum. Uh, maybe a more uh, uh, recent uh, example is the KKLT potential here. Here we have some a polynomial. So this is a polynomial term which leads to a repulsive potential. And it gives some uh, solution of this uh, nature. Again, the kinetic energy is, falls like 1 over t squared. And if the only attractive force is due to uh, an exponential term, then we end up having, again, this e to the minus t. And we find exactly the same problem as before. Um, even in the type 2a scenario, um, there is some overshooting problem. The overshooting problem in this case is not as bad. It's just you have to fine tune things um, polynomially with time rather than uh, exponentially. 
So the conclusion from all of that is that it would definitely be nice if we just could have some term in the action, in the uh, potential that grows with L. If I had a term that goes like L to the A, then it would be very nice. And this would probably generate new minima, but I don't care about this too much here. The thing that I do care about is that this will, uh, will definitely solve the overshooting problem. Um, but we have these general arguments due to uh, Dine and Zyberg that basically tells us that uh, we should not expect to find such terms because we do know basically, well, uh, a rough uh, argument is just that we do expect the 10 dimensional solution to be a solution, and if we have something that goes with L, then clearly, I'm probably doing something. Right. Oh, no. should. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So, so, uh, so, uh, basically, this argument is saying that uh, I don't expect to find something like that because this would mean that L goes to infinity is not a solution. But there is, of course, an assumption here that these potentials are time independent, and we don't live in a, a time independent uh, world. In particular, in cosmology, we have to. Uh, worry about some time-dependent potentials, and these are these might lead to uh, uh, potentials that go like that. Uh, so, a particular way to see that these are not just speculation, but you can actually find such a potential, is to imagine a, a, a zero plus p brain. Namely, this is a particle in our space-time, and it wraps p directions of the compact manifold. The potential that you find is, of course, this the same L to the p term that we had before, the same volume factor. And now this Einstein frame uh, factor gives us only 1 over L to the D minus 2, while before we had 1 over L uh, to the 2D. The reason for that is that now we have to worry about uh, the rescaling just along the time direction, so we just get this. Uh, and then here is, of course, this, uh, the particle density. So now we end up having something like that. And of course, P is bounded by D, but P minus D over 2 can definitely be positive, so that way we can generate something like this, which depends on the particle density. So this, of course, depends on time because of this N. Uh, N goes like A to the minus 3. Okay, N is the number of this part, uh, the density of these particles. This uh, zero plus p brain. Okay. Um, so what this is saying is that as the universe expands, this term becomes less and less important. But what is more important, what is more, a better way to say this is that the Calabria, the Calabria. Yes. Yes. It's not well. It scales with the expansion of the universe, but it's. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, so this indeed it, it uh, goes to zero as the universe expands, but what a better way, to, or a more intriguing way to say this is that these terms become more and more important in the early universe, and of course the problem that we are trying to solve is an early universe problem. So uh, let's see how this works. So heuristically, the way that we can imagine that the overshooting problem now works is very simple. Is very simple. We start here. So this is the same potential that we had before. This is the static potential. And that red line is this time-dependent potential. So at the early universe, n was big, and we lived there. Now the universe expands, n falls with a, so this potential becomes weaker, and we fall to that point. It becomes even weaker. We fall down there. Then it becomes... Then, uh, we stop here at the minimum, and this red thing just uh, go, it goes away. And of course, uh, now it would be nice to make sure that this actually works in terms of equations, and I can uh, give you a, a very quick uh, uh, explanation how all of this story actually works. So let's go back to the racetrack potential. We have a solution like this. 
a goes like t to, uh, to the uh, third. If I ignore the um, if I ignore the, the potential, the exponential potential, and now what I want to make sure is that before we had a problem that the potential. Yes. What was what? Here? Yeah. The blue line is the potential that we find. Uh, just this is just the static potential. You have some. Uh, that that comes from some exponential uh, effect. So you can imagine a KKLT-like potential. Can you see again why the um, L dependence changes? Yes, so yes, 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 yes. This is very important. Yes, 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 yes. That, that's the key. That's actually the key point. So you always have L to the P. But when you rescale from the so so now you go down to four dimensions, but you still have to go to uh, to Einstein frame. Okay. Now when you do that, each direction gives you that power one over l to the d over two. That's the wide rescaling that you have to do if you want to do that. Why now d over two and oh. was done? I said that each direction gives you that. Before when I had let's say a d three brain, you have four directions, so you get this four times. And now you get it, yes, sir. The problem I have here is the following. I mean, the, the presence of these uh, zero brains, for example, if you think of them as monopoles, for example, inside real space. Mm -hmm. And typically, if they're there before inflation, they will be inflated away. Perfect, perfect. You have, all, all, you have all the right questions, and, 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 and we'll talk about this. But uh, yeah, it's related to your previous question, and the, you'll see how it. it, it thank you. Okay. Um, uh, wait, what was that? Uh, oh, we talked about this, huh? Uh, yes, so we were here. So this is just to show you. So before we had this problem that we had this exponential term, which, which couldn't find the 1 over t squared kinetic energy. So now I want to explain why that term can. So this is how the potential looks like when I write it in terms of the canonically normalized scalar. Um, so n, as we said, goes like 1 over a cubed. A goes like t to the tail, so this y, I have this minus 1 here. And this is just that exponent. So I end up having something which in strength theory, when d is equal to 6, is just p minus 4. And I want that p minus 4 to be uh, bigger than 1 over t squared, so that this potential could uh, fight the, uh, or win, not just fight, or over the uh, uh, kinetic energy, and of course, this just means that p has to be bigger than 2. Okay? Mm. Uh, in KKLT, uh, well, it's very similar as you can imagine, but let's go through this uh, very quickly. We have the original potential is without the exponential term is something like this. This means that a uh, scale like that, and phi will go like that. And if I plug these two into the time-dependent potential, just like I did before, this is what I get from the A dependence. This is just the contribution from N. And L is just this thing. So if I put these two together, uh, I find that if I want this potential energy to win, to be bigger than the uh, kinetic energy, that's the condition. And just like... Uh, well, you can see, just like Lenny mentioned yesterday, you can see that when alpha goes to infinity, it's very easy to satisfy that condition. And actually, this is nice because in strength theory, one second, in strength theory, we have the, well, you cannot satisfy this if alpha is very near zero because what happens is that in this potential, uh, this, the particle, this n, would get diluted very, very quickly, which is the problem uh, or the point that you were making. But typically, we don't find such alphas in strength theory. So uh, this is good. Yes, you have a question. Yes. Oh, you, you mean strengths in our, in, yes. But what, so yes. Uh, right, 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 yes. Yes, and this actually, it's quite uh, helpful because the constant adds to the other friction. So, so you don't really need too much to, as you see, as you can see, uh, where was it? Let's go back here. 
You see, you don't need P to be too big in order to win, and the same goes for the string that you, uh, so, uh, that you uh, talked about. Okay, so this is, a, so this is a, the overshooting problem, and, the, um, and I'll, I'll get back to the, the questions you, you were asking, and, uh, but I just want to make one acute point about uh, inflation, and clearly, well, we, we should not expect to, ge to just generate inflation or long-lasting inflation because of these effects, because uh, the point that uh, you are making is just that even if uh, at the beginning I had a big number of, or the density was big because of the, I'm expecting to get uh, at least 60 foldings, so by the time inflation ends, the number, the density is tiny, and I really have to fine tune things uh, quite considerably if I want to generate inflation using these terms, and these terms will also contribute to the, to the energy density. It's going to be a big mess. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it is actually quite, uh, it's a nice setting uh, to set, to if, you, if you have some potential that can in principle generate inflation, what such an effect can do is to set uh, uh, the initial condition for inflation. And let me illustrate this in, so, so there are different mechanisms that something like that can, can happen, like, you know, like uh, a finite temperature effect, and et cetera. But, uh, but I want to uh, illustrate how this could happen in a particularly cute uh, um, model uh, for inflation, where, as far as I know, it's very hard to generate the same uh, initial condition using other, uh, other um, other mechanism. So here, this is a, a, an inflection point inflation. So we have some point, we have a potential. We fine-tune it. I'm not going to uh, fix this problem. That I fine-tune the original potential in such a way that there is an inflection point. I, have, uh, I can keep apologizing about that. I don't, I'm not going to do anything about it, though. Um, but what is nice if you do that is that inflation, if this happens, then you can generate inflation. Well, basically, you can generate lots of E foldings, um, basically by staying at the inflection point without going to a super Planckian uh, expectation value, which is, uh, which is a very uh, nice property because typically when I write some potential in field theory, then if I want to end up having uh, a large number of fee foldings, I really have to go to a super Planckian uh, expectation value, which makes this old field theory description a bit uh, mm, sketchy, maybe. Um, so here, here there is something very nice. If I know that I start here, then I will end up having a very nice uh, field theoretic uh, inflation-like uh, a story. The question, of course, is why should I start at the inflection point? Namely, if I start just a little bit above it, I will again overshoot. And if I overshoot, the fact that here the slow uh, roll parameters are uh, satisfied by definition is not good enough because I'm going to overshoot this too quickly, and I'm not going to generate a, uh, to generate a large number of uh, effolding. And you can imagine now what the solution might look like. I have something like that, I have a term like this, um, which again, you have the same mechanism, we go to, down to the inflection point, and then here I start to generate a large number of foldings. This blue line gets dilute, and I have, from that point on, I start with, uh, with ordinary inflation. Okay. So the conclusion from all of that is that it would uh, definitely be nice to have this uh, time-dependent potential. And, you know, you can do lots of uh, fun things with them. And this goes back again to uh, uh, one of your questions, is whether we have to postulate this. And if we do that, we really have a, a serious problem because when we go back in time, their energy density will blow up. This will add to the singularity if we have a period of inflation it will be exponential uh, growth, which makes things even worse. And I think that it would be much, much nicer if there is some mechanism that can generate this particle uh, dynamically. And actually, exactly such a mechanism was described um, 
um, three years ago uh, by uh, Kaufman, Lindelow, Maloney, uh, McAllister, and uh, Silverstein. And their mechanism is very, very uh, simple. So let's suppose that there is a point of where uh, some, of the, uh, some of the fields become uh, massless. And near that point, we have an action that looks like that. This is a, a complex field that's just for the simplicity. The other one is a scalar field, is, is, a, is a real field, and they interact in that way. So this is a, a very simple uh, looking um, um, effective action of the degrees of freedom near that special point where, where uh, these particles become massless. So a classical solution to the equation of motion is something like that, phi which plays the same role as the phi that we talked about before. This will be e to the phi will be our L. So here we have some uh, solution like that, which here is just a thread line. We have some impact parameter, which is phi naught. And we have some velocity, which I call the alpha squared. So of course, classically, this is a solution to the equation of motion, and that's the end of it. But quantum mechanically, now xi is a field that propagates in a time-dependent background. So uh, xi particles are going to be created that way. And once they are created, they will generate a potential for, for phi. So this creation of particles is exactly what, these are exactly the particles that we want to create to uh, generate a time-dependent potential for phi, which was <coughs> Our e to the phi is our L. Um, okay, so the question is, of course, how many particles are created? And that's a very simple uh, calculation to do. You just write down omega as a function of time with some, this is the special uh, direction momentum. That's the, the, the time dependent mass of these particles. And the simple uh, calculation that was actually done a uh, long time ago shows that this is what you get. Uh, it, it's a nice result because it looks like, uh, like uh, this looks like a Boltzmann factor where instead of alpha you have uh, the temperature, if you can imagine something like that. Um, and this is just a chemical potential for a non-relativistic uh, uh, mm -hmm. particle. So the, so the impact parameter is like the, uh, one second, is like the uh, potential, is just like the uh, chemical potential, which makes sense. Because as you go further from that point, uh, as you go further from that point, you don't expect to generate too many particles. So, yes. Time derivative of phi. Oh, yeah. so sorry. Uh, so this is the this is the time derivative alpha square. So alpha alpha is a is a, a dimension of mass, and you you get. A, you get something like that. Okay, k is the momentum, and you get uh, k squared over alpha squared. Okay? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so there are different time scales in that problem, and um, one time scale, of course, is uh, when how much time it takes to create this, and this can be re this is just uh, one over the square root of g times alpha. There is the other time scale, which is how much time it takes for uh, these particles to absorb all the energy from the original classical uh, background, and this is also a fairly simple calculation. It's just one over g to the f five uh, half time, uh, times alpha. And this is an important uh, point because what this is saying is this is the time that it takes for, if you wish, for the reheating in that particular process. And the third, <coughs> the third time scale is the thermization time scale because what will happen is that these guys will fall back and they will start to reinteract. <coughs> so until they reach uh, some temperature, and this is, of course, even bigger than that. Now, this is all very nice, but we would like to relate or to embed all of this in cosmology. And in cosmology, we have yet an additional time scale, which is the time scale associated with the uh, Hubble uh, expansion. So we have uh, 
now we have to so so now we have to worry about whether the other uh, the other time is bigger or smaller than the time scales the field theory time scales that I mentioned before. So for, first of all, we want if we would want to create a, a, a nice number of these particles, we definitely want the other scale to be bigger than the creation time. We don't want the universe to expand too fast. This gives us this condition. Um, we also want to make sure that once we've created these particles, they are not annihilated, so we have to reach some kind of a freeze out. Uh, namely, the Arbel time should be smaller than the uh, equilibrium time. This gives that condition. And of course, you can easily see that both of these conditions uh, could be satisfied in a weekly coupled field theory, which is nice. This is just to say that we can create and keep these particles using uh, that mechanism. Uh, so the picture now looks something like that. I still haven't said anything uh, about inflation, but now you can, you can see why it works better. You start to roll like this. You end up, of course, by the end of inflation, you don't have much. Uh, you just have this classical field which rolls down here. It goes down. Once it crosses some uh, near this, uh, uh, this ESP point, these particles will be created. They will form this potential. And the rest of the story is just like it's just like before. We have something like this. Okay. Um, the point, which is uh, actually a, it's a fairly uh, nice point, is that we don't have to cross. This doesn't have to be a point where the particles are strictly speaking massless. It is sufficient that uh, we are crossing fairly nearby such a point. And that's, a, that's an important point because it makes all of this story much more uh, uh, likely to happen. Uh, you don't need to fine tune uh, that much. Um, the reason is basically, so here I have, this is the time direction, this is phi. I start here as before I cross this point and after that I reach the minimum. And the condition for phi to stop at the minimum is something like that. You can recognize some of the ingredients. Of course, it goes like the uh, coupling constant. And we have this exponential suppression because of this uh, same effect with this impact parameter. And now since phi grows only logarithmically with time, we, you can easily see that this time is exponentially that the minimum time is going to be exponentially t uh, bigger than uh, the ESP time. So it's fairly easy to satisfy this condition, even without fine tuning, and even if this exponential is pretty small. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk about uh, is, a, is a, a fairly acute uh, potential bonus that we have here, that uh, we might end up uh, having uh, D-brains as, as a mega heavy dark metal candidate. And uh, whether or not, well, of course, this is very unlikely. We all expect WIMPs at the TV scale, et cetera. But it, it's nice to know that it might happen. And I just want to remind you that there is no obvious experimental upper bound on the mass of the dark matter candidate. Well, there is a huge one, but I don't remember the numbers. But it's definitely not the Planck scale or something like that. But theoretically, of course, even if we have particles that are very heavy, we are not in the usual setup. We are not going to uh, generate them if their mass is uh, smaller than the heat, is bigger than the reheating temperature. So we don't consider those as candidates for that matter. Uh, of course, we can think about parametric resonance, and that can improve things a little bit. But just a little bit, we can't push this too much, uh, even though naively we think that you can with parametric resonance. Um, but in this scenario, as I want to uh, kind of sketch the, the argument, you can imagine that you actually end up having a, a mega heavy uh, dark metal candidate, and it goes like this. Basically, the mass of this, if these particles are indeed the dark matter candidate, then their mass goes like the t their tension, of course, times uh, L at that, at the minimum, minus L here. And there is no obvious relationship between this mass and the rating temperature. 
So you can imagine that this mass is huge. It might be super Planckian, and the radiating temperature is still uh, fairly, fairly low. Um, so there are two, depending on the um, depending on the shape of the potential and, of course, the interactions between these brains and the standard model fields, you can imagine two, two uh, scenarios. One is the, is the one that I just described. If the Abel time is between the equilibrium time and the creation time, we can get these mega heavy dark matter uh, um, particles. And if we uh, and we reheat the universe as usual here, so we just create the dark matter here. These guys uh, stay forever, and we reheat the universe here. Um, and then this is this is interesting from the dark matter perspective because uh, these are uh, this can be, as I said, fairly heavy uh, uh, object. But generally speaking, I don't. Uh, have too much time to explain why. This is not going to help. Everything that we've gained by doing this, we lose uh, in terms of the empty universe versus overshooting problem, if that's the setup. Uh, the other setup is that the reheating, is that the, sorry, is that the other time is bigger or equal to this equilibrium time. Actually, it should be of the order of the equilibrium time. Because then what happens is that, um, well, then the setup is that you create Let's go here. I create these particles here, and one. So, so the, the usual. So then, so that should answer your uh, original question, and hopefully also your second question. I have some period of inflation. As usual, there is the end of a slow roll, and all the energy goes to the uh, kinetic energy of this phi, and and uh, then I'm crossing that point here. <laughs> Once, I, once this happened, all of these particles are created. They absorb all of the energy from the kinetic energy of the coherent, uh, of this classical field, and they decay into ordinary in dark matter, and that's the Big Bang. Now, of course, in this case, we don't have these uh, mega heavy particles at the end, so in that sense, it's, it's boring. But what is nice uh, about that is that um, what nice about that is that this can help actually quite a lot with this tension that, we, that I described between the empty universe problem and the overshooting problem. And I would like to think that this might actually, that this scenario could help us um, with the cosmological constant problem as well. But I, uh, since I don't feel comfortable enough saying uh, anything concrete about that, uh, I'll probably end my talk saying something that I do feel comfortable enough saying. Uh, happy, happy birthday. So, so yes, yeah, so I don't. I, I, that's exactly what I don't neglect. That's the old point. So here, uh, so maybe I should explain it here. So at that point, when I create them, they are massless. So I don't have to worry about the speculation too much. Now, as I roll down, they become more and more massive, and that's exactly the effect that I'm looking for. Right, but the effect that you're taking from this is the classical potential if you wish yeah. that they generate. That's right. But at least people have looked at similar. Back reaction mechanisms uh, in the case of uh, such similar situations, in particular, Thomas and Woodard and Bradley and Carl. Okay. And I think what they find is that the, uh, interpreting the back reaction just in terms of potential may be misleading. In fact, okay. there are more complicated effects that like what? can take place. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to hear about that. I, I, 
I, I, first of all, I haven't looked at the back reaction. I assume that it's not going to play a significant role, um, but I would love to, to hear about that. And one more thing is that uh, because uh, you are slowing, of course, the generation of these particles is slowing, the back reaction is expected to slow down, of course, the rolling of the fire, right? Uh -huh. And this, at the same time, will boost the, 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 the expansion of the universe, right? Um, boost, like, you mean because it falls? Yes, yes, yes. So, yes. Uh, don't you expect also this factor to uh, increase the expansion of the right. so, so this, is, so it depends on which of the scenarios you are talking about. I think that in that scenario, that's a, a perfect uh, setting in which I don't have to worry about it, because all the energy eventually goes to these mega, to these deep brains, and I have basically all the energy there, and then they uh, decay, and that's the Big Bang. So once they decay, you go into a A to the minus 4 kind of uh, universe. Yes? Which, in which, uh, in the second or the first? Uh, in, the, in the first? I can't hear you. In order not to have an empty universe, you need deep In the second, so in the second one, in the second one, what happens? Let me, uh, uh, in the second one, okay. Um, in the second one, what happens is that this potential can be very small, and that's the nice thing about that. Um, but in the first one, since uh, in the first setup, you, d just having this difference is not enough, and you really have to fine-tune that potential in such a way that you don't have the overshooting problem. So these are two different uh, scenarios. The second one is the more uh, interesting from the dark matter point of view. The first one is more interesting from the uh, dark matter point of view. Any other questions?